Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Google Meet and welcome to Boston Virtual ARTCC's third session of Ground School. Today's session, we'll look at VFR departure and arrival procedures. Alec is going to give you an introduction in just a moment. The session is normally held both by Alec and Krigor, but Krigor has had a busy week, decided to take this one off, apparently, and he's left it all up to Alec. So we'll see if Alec is up to the challenge here to talk to us about VFR procedures. So Alec, take it away. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, as Evan mentioned, we'll be talking VFR departure and arrival procedures. We covered weather uh, last week, so this week we're going over VFR, so good weather flying. How do we depart and arrive airports, both controlled and uncontrolled? Feel free to um, raise questions either in TeamSpeak or preferably in Google Meet. Actually, let's just keep it exclusively to Google Meet. Post them in the chat, and I will answer them as I see them. And if I don't see them, I'm sure that Evan will remind me to take a look at the chat. Um, unless anybody has any objections, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's VFR traffic pattern operation session, it's going to help you guys understand how a VFR pattern is designed at both controlled and uncontrolled airports. In other words, airports that both have a control tower or air traffic control and those that don't. Um, this is going to help you guys uh, fly smarter and safer with and without ATC guidance, just as in the real world. We're going to provide an overview of the traffic pattern and we'll see why it's called that way. We're going to talk about different types of entries and departures and overall just general knowledge that's really important to have for flying in the virtual and the real world. So what is a traffic pattern? A traffic pattern is a standard set of procedures that VFR, so Visual Flight Rules Aircraft, use to operate in the vicinity of an airport, either controlled or uncontrolled. As a quick reminder, controlled airports have a control tower, so air traffic control issues instructions on joining and departing. Uncontrolled airports have a common frequency for pilots to coordinate amongst themselves. How does a pattern work? There are five legs, and we'll go over each of them. And they're based on the direction of the flight relative to the wind. You'll see that being a really important theme here tonight, where the wind is coming from and where the runway is oriented relative to the wind. It begins at the departure end of the active runway, so where the airplane actually lifts off that end and, are, and ends at the uh, side of the runway where the airplane lands. As a quick reminder, airplanes always take off and land into the wind. Um, so you try to take off and land with a headwind. That is why all of the legs of a traffic pattern are designed around um, said wind. You'll see a brief overview here. First up, we have the upwind. That is where airplanes take off. They fly on a runway heading for about half to three quarters of a mile into the wind to gain altitude. Then they turn crosswind. That's a 90 degree left turn usually, uh, flying perpendicular to the wind. Then they turn downwind, and it's called the downwind because the wind is pushing you. They fly parallel to the runway, then another turn to base, and then another turn to final. So there are no official regulations with regards to traffic pattern entries, only the flow. An IFR arrival would almost definitely follow the requirements of the cleared instrument approach, which means they are going to be on a long straight and final because they are following an instrument approach. It is for these reasons that a VFR arrival would never, or usually never fly a long straight and final because they would be in direct conflict with IFR aircraft. The traffic pattern entry information is not technically regu regulatory, but very strongly, uh, very, very strongly recommended. And it's provided by advisory circulars, the Aeronautical Information Manual, and the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, also known as the PHAC. A, a good way to think about it is like a stop sign, or at least in the US, or well, namely Massachusetts. I'm assuming the rules aren't that different for other places. If you come to a stop sign, there are a certain set of rules as to who pulls up. For example, the person who pulled up to the other person's right at the same time gets the right of way. And you have similar rules in VFR traffic patterns. Um, these are not legally mandated, but if somebody doesn't follow them, you could end up with a very bad day. Yes. I didn't hear anything. Was there a question, Alec? Or? Uh, I think there might have been a question in TeamSpeak, but uh, yeah, I think Jay doesn't. Yeah, that's Jay uh, asking a question in TeamSpeak oh, no. and all Jay, the... we're doing all the audio in Google Meet, so if you want to join the Google Meet and then ask your question there, that'd be cool. I'll get him to move over. Okay. Um, 
unless anyone has any questions, we can go ahead and continue. Okay. So, big question here is, which direction do we turn? At a towered airport, easy enough, air traffic control makes the decision for you. They'll specify left down and right down and left base, right base, etc., etc. On towered airport, a little different. You make all turns to the left unless you're otherwise indicated. Um, the reasoning for that being almost always the pilot in command sits on the left side of the airplane, so there it's easier for them to see the runway environment on the left side, hence all turns being made to the left. Some airports um, have an exception where it's a non-standard pattern. So you're going to see a segmented circle on the airport. Um, you can see that the windsock is in a segmented circle instead of a straight one. So the pattern is to the right side of the runway. The air, uh, airport facilities directory, which is now called the chart supplement, you will see right traffic on the runway description there. And lastly, if you look at a sectional chart, it'll say RP for the pattern for the specific runway. Um, most often that's for reasons such as noise abatement, like they don't want to overfly a town or a school, or for terrain or obs otherwise obstruction. Uh, but almost always turns to the made our, uh, turns are made to the left in a traffic pattern, and only in rare instances where they are clearly marked, turns are made to the right. And as a reminder, towered airports, air traffic control will tell you. So how do you fly a traffic pattern? Unless it's otherwise noted in what is now called the chart supplement, traffic patterns are flown at 1,000 feet above the ground, uh, with some exceptions to larger or turbine aircraft, they fly at 1,500 above the ground. Ultralights and helicopters operate at 500 feet above the ground. So how do you actually depart? First, depart the runway on the upwind leg so you maintain runway track. What's runway track? Runway track is uh, accounts for the extended center line of the runway. Basically, um, you fly whatever heading you need to to account for the wind so that your aircraft is flying exactly the heading of the runway. Uh, about th um, within 300 feet of pattern altitude, turn crosswind. Personally speaking, I do it a little later. I do it at about 500 feet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misread that. Turn within 300 feet of pattern altitude. So five to 700 feet above the runway, depending on the airport, you would start your crosswind turn. Again, uh, you turn crosswind so that your track is 90 degrees uh, perpendicular to the uh, runway heading. And then about half a mile to a mile from the runway, you turn downwind. Now again, you track parallel to the runway to account for wind. You maintain pattern altitude, so usually about a thousand feet until you are abeam the approach end of the land <laughs> runway. A good way to a good way to um, to figure out when you start descending is when your wing is opposite or abeam the place you want to land. So let's say your aiming point is the thousand foot markers on the runway or the thousand footers. You would maintain pattern altitude until you're abeam that point. At your discretion, you turn base. So at that point, you've already started descending. A good uh, way to do this is if you're sitting on the left side of the airplane and you're flying in the left downwind, such as in the depiction here, you look behind the wing, 45 degrees behind the wing. If that's when the runway threshold is, that's when you start your base turn. That's a good rule of thumb. Uh, at least a quarter mile for the runway to give yourself a, uh, room to stabilize the final. Now, theoretically, you're supposed to maintain 200 knots or less in the pattern. Uh, in the vast majority of aircraft that we're flying both on the network and in real life to start out with, uh, getting above anywhere above 150 is a challenge. Uh, but be sure to maintain 200 knots or less in the pattern if you are flying something that's capable of going that fast. I see no questions in the chat, so we will continue. Entering folks, the pattern. If you do have, uh, sorry to interrupt, Alec, but if folks do have questions, feel free to post them in the chat, or just like last week, feel free to just unmute your microphone and ask away. We're more than happy to make this a discussion. If you have anything you'd like to feel free to contribute, go ahead and do so. Okay, good. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to how do we actually enter the pattern. There are two different techniques for entering the pattern, and they depend on both type of airport and the direction of arrival. At towered airports, easy enough. Just listen to what a traffic control tells you and enter on the leg they tell it to. It's usually, that you're usually, usually told to either enter downwind, enter a base, or make straight in if you're already aligned with the runway. 
If it's a downwind or a base, they will tell you either left or right, whichever makes more sense. At an untowered airport, you enter the runway at pattern altitude, uh, at the midpoint of the runway, or what's called a midfield crossover. You fly over the center of the runway at a 90 degree angle and enter the downwind leg if you are from the other side of the runway, or a 45 degree entry. You maneuver the aircraft to intercept the downwind leg at a 45 degree angle abeam the midpoint of the runway. And we see that on the next slide here. The 45 degree is arguably the most common of the untowered airport pattern entries because it provides for both the best visibility and the most standardized pattern, least turning required. Go ahead. If you're told to enter base, you do have to enter the base. Otherwise, you could request a downwind entry. But if you're told to enter the base, you would have to enter the base. I got to miss that question in Google Meet. So, Alan, if you could, if you could actually ask the question here in Google Meet, that oh, would be I'm fantastic. sorry, I thought that was uh, I'm, I thought that was transmitted in Google Meet. Uh, yeah, no and, and next time, um, uh, for everyone in the audience, if you have a question, unmute your microphone on Google Meet and uh, ask it there. The question was, uh, if you are flying into a towered airport and you are told by air traffic control to enter the base leg, can you just enter on the down leg? Uh, no, you can't. Uh, there's probably a reason for why they gave you a base entry. So you should enter on the base. If you are so inclined to enter on the downwind, be sure to request it and air traffic control will approve it if they can. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. Moving on, untowered airport, if you're approaching from the side um, with the pattern, you would uh, enter on Ideally, what's called a 45 degree ink. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, words are hard. You would enter on the 45 to the downwind, which means you draw a 45 degree line to the downwind and enter so that you only make a 45 degree turn to join the downwind. If you're on the other side of the airport, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. You would start flying towards the airport at pattern altitude you'd cross the runway midfield at pattern altitude, and then you'd make a left 90 degree turn to join the left downwind, or I guess if you're coming on the other side, the right downwind. But you would join, uh, make a 90 degree left turn in this case to join the left downwind for runway seven. And then things get a little trickier. If you are even farther from the airport, you could just do a, um, what's called a teardrop. Sorry, didn't mean to go that far you could do a teardrop turn into the runway. Another method, if you're coming in real high, you could overfly the airport 500 feet above TPA, or traffic pattern altitude, then make a right turn to, or a right turning 270 degree turn to join the downwind. This is called a teardrop. So as a reminder, two ways of doing that, either the first 90 degree turn to the left at pattern altitude or flying above the runway and joining uh, the right teardrop. And then the intermediate uh, slide here was the preferred method of joining the 45, flying far away from the airport and then joining the downwind at a 45 degree angle. Assuming no questions, we will move on. When air traffic control uh is uh, giving you a, a pa uh, an entry in the pattern. Can they ask you to join in the crosswind, or is it only on the downwind? Uh, on the crosswind, or is it always on the downwind or the base? I guess they theoretically could have you join the crosswind if that was the direction you're coming from. Uh, but it, it's almost always the downwind or the base. I, I, theoretically possible to join the crosswind. I've never heard it in real life or on Batsim. Uh, you can expect to be told to join on the downwind at the base. The reason for that being, it would just be kind of awkward. So let's say right now you were the black airplane on the screen in the bottom right corner. Theoretically, air traffic control could ask you to join the left crosswind for runway seven, which means it makes a 45 degree turn to the right and joins the crosswind for runway seven. What's easier though, they're already set up for the right 45 degree to the downwind for runway seven. So that's more likely what they would choose. And again, I mean, it, it's it all comes down to when you are talking with air traffic control, it just comes down to clarity on what's expected. So if you want a certain entry, you can ask for it. If you get a certain entry that you weren't expecting, you can ask about it. At the end of the day, the most important thing is that there's clarity on where you're going to be. 
at a lot of airports in real world, and this is simulated sometimes on VATSIM as well, we don't always have radar coverage at low levels. So you might be told to enter a right downwind, and we might not actually be able to see whether you are in fact doing that on the radar. We're relying on the reports that you make, and then some people literally will simulate a tower view and simulate looking out of the windows with the binoculars. We can actually do that on VATSIM. And so if you tell me that you're on a right downwind, and I'm looking there and I don't see an airplane there, that's obviously going to be an issue. So we just want to make sure that there's a lot of clarity on what both ends of the spectrum. You understand what it is air traffic control asks for, and they can find you where they're expecting to find you. But as Alex said, I think you'd most often hear a downwind, a base, or a final for how to enter the pattern. And of course, what we're seeing on this slide is an untowered airport scenario. So you're flying into an airport that is either not towered at all, so like a class echo, class G airport, or we're flying into an airport where normally there'd be a tower, but their tower controller isn't online at the moment. Okay. Well, now, when, won't, the, uh, won't the tower or the ATC release you if you're, if you're flying into an untowered airport as soon as you have the airport? Am I not correct? You're thinking uh, probably uh, an IFR arrival there, Douglas? What's that now? It sounds to me like you're thinking about an IFR arrival. No, I, actually, I'm thinking of VFR. If you're going from, say, a um, uh, 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 Class B airport and you want a flight following, and then you're going to land at an untowered airport, isn't ATC going to end the flight following as soon as you have the airport in sight? Yes. So, so now, now we're talking about an untowered airport. So 100% correct. ATC is going to do that. And so in the untowered scenario, which is what we are looking at on this slide, you have actually, if Alec, if you can go forward one slide, there's sort of three different options for how you can enter the pattern. I think it may be a couple slides now. Yeah, there it is. So this gives you pretty much a nice summary of what you can do in the scenario where you're going to an untowered airport and you've been released by ATC. You've got options one, 2A, and 2B. What Alan was asking about is the scenario where you're at a towered airport and you're asked to enter a certain leg of the pattern by ATC. So different scenarios. Okay, understood. Alan, did we get your all your questions? Did you have any follow up? Yeah, I just have one more. Uh, if a controller is telling you uh, to enter right on a crosswind, so uh, on the left pattern, so that would still mean that you stay in the left pattern anyway. So it's not it's not as expecting you to do a right pattern, does it? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm, I'm a little confused about what you mean. Okay, so uh, if I'm coming to an airport and uh, the the air traffic control is asking me to enter enter right on on uh, on a crosswind, that would be for left traffic pattern. Would that be? Um. No, and that's that's one of the reasons you would almost never, or in my case, have never heard a crosswind entry into a towered airport. It just doesn't make much more sense mm -hmm. to have the aircraft cross the runway uh, extended center line to join the other side when they can just join the downwind for the side that they're already on. Um, so, in, so, yeah, it, in that scenario, it, I think you'd be more likely to almost do what you see in 2B here. If, if that was the scenario they wanted, I would expect they might instruct you to just cross midfield and join a downwind, for example as opposed to doing a crosswind. But yeah, exactly. when ATC even... gives you a direction, so let's say they tell you to join a left downwind, that's implying it's left pattern. So even if there's a published okay. right pattern for that runway, if you're told by the controller, enter a left downwind, enter left base, you're always doing left-hand turns now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the only time I've ever gotten an instruction in the real world was um, that, that wasn't to join the side I'm already on was uh, two airports, Martha's Vineyard to Petri DeKalb, they'll say cross over the field and then join the other downwind other than the side that you're already on. Um, they would almost never have you join a crosswind turn because that would push you into a conflict with aircraft that are departing the runway. Mm -hmm. You'd be right in their way. We can okay, talk a little bit, just since we're here, Alec, and we have some time, we can talk a little bit about pattern entries. I think I'm maybe the odd one out where my preference is always to be in this slide, and I think not everyone agrees with me, but my view is the safest place for me at an untowered airport is to cross right overhead the field. Nobody's taking off and nobody's landing right in the middle of the runway. I'm at the pattern altitude already, so I have great visibility. If there is somebody in the proper downwind, I'll be able to see them. And what I don't like about number one is you're basically going out either a long way out of the way or you're going straight into the departure path of anyone that might be departing at the moment. So I always like to be when I'm dealing with untowered airports, but I know there's different preferences. 
So I definitely prefer either 1 or 2B. I'm not a huge fan of 2A just because you're flying away from the airport and you lose sight of the runway and possibly lose situational awareness because you're descending and turning at the same time. I do like uh, A because I find that the 45 degree turn, I know it takes you a little farther from the field, but as you uh, uh, do make that second turn to join the 45, that uh, that gives you the most awareness of what's going on over the field because for 2B, uh, when you're over the runway, you might not see aircraft that are directly under your nose or in front of you or um, to the left and right of you. And you do see almost all that on the 45. But uh, again, none of these are incorrect. It's all a matter of personal preference. Do you get a nice view of the windsock, though, when you fly over the field? I remember, I remember the 2B is the only the safest because you'll be crossing well above, but also you'll be able to look at the airport. Many uh, uncontrolled have problems with people goofing around on them, whatever, if it's not very busy. Also, there could be aircraft without radios, uh, uh, you know, ultralights or whatever. So people make a mistake of making this teardrop as a continuous quick maneuver. No, the whole point of, uh, um, sorry, 2, uh, 2A, the whole point of 2A is to fly away after you examine the airport and then descend and re-enter on 45, yet you are stable on 45, for at least two miles. You're able to examine the situation and be completely in control, including flying away if there's too many people already on. The only comment I have is, and a question, 500 above, but the, there are 1,500 um, uh, patterns for, for twins, Shouldn't then really the safest way would be 2,000 above the airport AGL? So, I, I again, I'd like to comment that, in my opinion, there is no one objectively safest way and that all of these are entirely situation dependent. There's a reason that the AIM publishes all of these as possible entries. With that said, we did cover in a previous line that, 1500, that twins and turbines will fly 1,500 feet above the ground for their pattern. Um, so if you are on the radio and you hear one of those, 2A might not be the safest. With that said, for most uh, single engine pistons, if you're over the field at T or at airport, uh, I'm sorry, traffic pattern elevation plus 1000, as you just said, that is a lot of altitude to lose uh, from your turn over the field to the downwind, which would possibly make you um, unstabilized coming into the downwind. Um, so I guess, in my opinion, there is no one objectively safest catch-all way to enter the pattern, which is why all three of these are published. You just have to use your discretion when entering an uncontrolled airport, have good situational awareness of all the traffic there, keep your eyes open and figure out what the best way is. Uh, what if you're coming in from the right side in this picture or the top right? Is it better to loop down around the bottom and then enter the 45 that way? Is that preferred method? If I was over the word summary in this picture, uh, the way that I would do it in the real world and the way that I would teach my students is to be in this case. Um, first of all, listen on the radio. That's the that's the best way of figuring out what's going on at an airport. What are we I'm use? talking about, I'm sorry, I'm talking about more, assuming those runway numbers weren't there, over to the east or the right side of this picture. If I was on the right side of the screen, I would fly to the southwest towards where the red teardrop is and then make a right turn to join the 45 to the left downwind. Okay, thank you. That's what I figured. That's what I would do. But again, I think, like Alex says, I think there's totally discretion given by the aim for you to pick any of these three. I mean, you, you could very easily decide you wanted to cross over the field. And there might be reasons other than just where you are that make that difference. So it might be you really want to get a look at the windsock because the AWOS is saying something, but you don't trust it. Or maybe the AWOS is giving you some kind of a weather phenomenon like fog or cloud that you don't see and you want to have a really good look at it. You haven't been to this airport before. You want to see what the runway looks like. You want to see if it's you know, if it's a grass strip. Is it in good condition? So there's, I think, all kinds of factors that would really play into that decision. It, certainly the geography and the angle you're approaching the airport might be one of those things. And obviously you could certainly do a runway inspection with a low approach as well as passing overhead the field. But I personally like that overhead the field method because it really gives you that good picture of what you can expect to see when you get there. Again, that's personal preference. Yeah. And I think the aim gives you the flexibility to choose any of these three options. Yeah, I agree with Evan. That's what I would do and teach in the real world. If you're going to an airport that you have never been to before um, and you don't know anything about, for example, the runway conditions, it's always good to ever enter over the field and see, okay, perhaps the runway has big potholes. Or if I don't have a taxi diagram, where should I plan on exiting the runway, left or right? Uh, things like that. 
what happens when there's some sort of wildlife on the runway, like a moose, which has yeah. definitely never happened to me before. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are actually Alaskan airports that actually have an, an advice. Don't just fly in, overfly first because of yep. that reason. Yeah, so uh, moral of the story here without getting too caught up on this slide, very situation dependent, no objectively correct or incorrect answer. Just keep your eyes open, keep your ears listening to the radio and exercise good judgment. That's the moral of the story. Question. Yes, Mike. Um, I'm sorry to back up a little bit. He, there is published on uncontrolled and controlled uh, when it's RP, right pattern, otherwise left pattern. Now, should you always follow that? Because I've seen on Vatsaman in real life, people just waltzing in whichever pattern they want. I thought that when it's RP, you're flying the RP no matter what, except for controlled, obviously, but I mean uncontrolled. Hmm. That's a good question. Legally, I'd have to look up, um, I guess it would be in part 91, or, uh, well, the aim isn't regulatory, so it would have to be in part 91. Um, I would have to look it up. My suspicion is uh, legally no. My suspicion is legally that if it says right pattern, that's still uh, advisory. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, if you find me after the session today, I'll look it up in the FARs and give you a more concrete answer. I'm, I, I'm not sure for this one um, it, what the legality is. You should obviously do what is published unless there is a very strong reason to do otherwise. For example, let's say there's a very huge uh, bank of fog on the opposite downwind and you want to and you want to fly what's not published in the interest of safety, I could understand that. But uh, it, generally speaking, it, you should fly what's published. Okay, good, thanks. I'll, I'll give you a more concrete answer after I look it up after the session. Yeah, Matt, um, we were specifically, Matt, uh, Matt says in the chat, I think it's more specific to noise abatement or obstruction. That is why you would publish a non-standard pattern. I'm talking about um, specifically disregarding those instructions and flying the opposite of what's published. Um, in, in, if that's what the interest of safety calls for, then that may be, you'll say like there's a fire or something and there's smoke. But generally speaking, we fly what's published. All right. Let's talk about the downwind entry. Downwind entry simply is easy enough. You are already aligned with the runway, so you just join up on the downwind or the 45 degree to it if you're just north of the airport in this picture. Easy enough. Well, just and for you, clarity, guys, now obviously we're talking about towered airports, right? So we've just finished off the untowered airport scenario where we have no one to actually specifically give us an instruction. Now we've moved on to dealing with airports that are towered so there is a controller they're giving you these instructions to join on the downwind and that's that's what these slides are describing yeah i should have specified that we're now at a towered airport we're being told what to do then you have a base entry they tell you to enter the left base in this case so you just join up on the base and skip the downwind entirely they could also tell you a straight in approach which is the same thing as joining up on the final you're already aligned with the runway so you just continue inbound towards the runway So that was a bunch of air stuff on actually arriving the pattern. That's all well and good. Now let's see we want to take off again. How do we depart? These also vary on uh, the type of airport and the direction of flight. Towered airport, same deal here as on towered or, or as towered arriving. You just depart the pattern by extending the specified leg, usually upwind, crosswind, or downwind as told by air traffic control. At an untowered airport, let's get a little trickier again, you continue straight out, in other words known as an extended upwind, or you exit with a 45 degree turn in the direction of the traffic pattern after reaching pattern altitude. And once you're clear of any traffic pattern altitude vertically and laterally, you proceed on course. So this is an example of maintaining straight out departure or turning five degree, uh, 45 degrees towards the direction of the pattern. Now, what about helicopters? Some helicopters will land on surfaces other than the active runway. This helps to avoid the flow of fixed wing aircraft. They also generally fly lower patterns for this reason, and they land on a marked helipad or a suitable clear area or a ramp or something along those lines. Occasionally, runways are the only option. Let's say it's a very small airport with a, small, with a very small ramp that's already full. Uh, the runway might be the only option. Standard pattern does uh, may be used if it doesn't conflict with any fixed wing traffic. 
Helicopters operating in the traffic pattern when landing on the runway may fly a pattern similar to fixed wing, but at a lower altitude, 500 feet above the ground instead of 1,000 and closer to the runway because they don't have to be as far out. They might be landing on the opposite side from fixed wing traffic only when airspeed requires or to practice power off landings, which will happen all the time. So helicopters have a little bit more rain as to what they can and can't do. Now let's go to a controlled airport where we do have an air traffic control tower telling us exactly what to do. Upwind departure, easy enough. Just fly out on the upwind and go wherever it is you're going. Crosswind departure, depart on the crosswind, make a 90 degree turn towards the crosswind and see you later. Downwind departure, you uh, instead of leveling, uh, you, this is treated just like a normal pattern, but instead of leveling off and maintaining traffic pattern altitude in the downwind, you just keep on climbing away from the airport. So that was a lot of things we covered on the different types of patterns. Um, there are a bunch of resources on uh, departing and arriving uncontrolled and controlled airports, namely FAA Advisory Circular 90-66B. Uh, we have an uncontrolled airport operations notice, notice to airmen found on the BVA forums. We have the Aeronautical Information Manual, uh, Chapter 4-3-3, the Airplane Flying Handbook, Chapter 7, published by the FAA. There's a bunch of knowledge in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, and the PRP program earlier mentioned, soon to be called Wings Over New England, has a bunch of VRFAR um, flights. Well, thanks for those links for people to join in the chat here if you would like to be able to access those materials directly. They are there. A quick shout out for Wings Over New England and the current pilot ratings program. If you want to see this stuff all put into practice, we go through in a series of six VFR flights all of what you've just seen. So you'll see operations at untowered airports. You'll see pattern entries at four different towered airports, maybe five if my math is wrong, and you'll be able to experience entering the class Bravo airspace at Boston as well. So that's a great flight series for people to participate in if you're looking for a little bit more information. Uh, Mike, I did just while Alec was talking there, I had the chance to have a quick look. So FAR 91.126 basically tells you it's a requirement to follow the RP. So it indicates that if there's no other indication, left turns is required and if there is any kind of display at the airport approved light signals or visual markings indicating that turns are made to the right then turns that's made to the right so it's unclear as to whether specifically the sectional it says rp is what makes it a legal requirement but certainly if you see a segmented circle or any other marking indicating that right turns should be made there's support in 91.126 that that would be regulation and it would be required yeah, my guess is uh, the, the charge supplement would be a legal, uh, a legal regulation, and the charge supplement would say right pattern if uh, if runway did have right pattern. So to answer your question, Mike, yes, it's uh, yeah. it is a legal mandate. Excellent. Now, of course, that won't stop people from doing their own thing and flying into untowered airports without talking on oh the radio God, and all yeah. those great yeah. things we see in real life, right? But yeah, but certainly it's for the, for us though, and for on Batsim, you know, we don't fortunately see a whole lot of traffic around untowered airports. But let's try our best to, you know, comply with the rules and, and demonstrate a good example. Yeah. Um, another thing that came up last time that we might just mention is that I made the suggestion that it might be appropriate in an untowered airspace when you're on the radio to refer to yourself by your aircraft type, so white Cessna as opposed to your call sign. But apparently the FAA has come out, I guess, relatively recently and said actually that's not a good practice, and they're emphasizing the use of call signs instead. Pretty yeah, it's described in the in the AIM paragraph four two four. Um, it says, I'll link it here. Uh, where does it say? Use of improper call signs can result in pilots executing clearance instead of another aircraft. Uh, where am I looking? Here, I'll post it in the chat. Basically, this AIM paragraph talks about using proper call signs. Uh, you should use your tail number, even if it may seem impractical. The FAA requires that you use your tail number. We're done a little early here, so if people have any other questions that you want to ask, whether it be about VFR procedures, radio communications, any of the stuff we've covered in the last few slides, happy to take questions either via the chat or alternatively, just feel free to unmute here in Google Meet and share your questions. This tends to be a little bit of a shorter session. The next one will make up for that when we look at IFR clearances, which goes through not just the clearance and the phraseology, but we look at departure procedures, routes, 
potential reroutes and all kinds of other things like that. So good, we got a couple questions. Alec, I don't know if you want to start with these, but the first one was around simulation of radio failures. Do we simulate radio failures in, um, are you talking about, uh, are you talking about VATSIM? I'm assuming you're going to talk about VATSIM. Uh, and on VATSIM, we simulate, we, we are able to simulate those to an extent, I guess, uh, if the controller is able to accommodate. So you should ask the controller if they are able to accommodate um, and squawk 7600 accordingly, but you should never just assume that the controller is able to accommodate a radio failure and then um, and then just do it. I was just in the process of writing a wings flight that looks at simulated failures, and so I've just read through the add some code of conduct on this. And as Alex says, it pretty much is at the controller's discretion as far as what type of emergency we're willing to accept. The only thing you absolutely cannot do is a hijacking in the squawk of 7500. That'll get you kicked off right away. Short of that, though, if you want to simulate a failure in a realistic way, and particularly if you get approval for it to begin with, usually that's something we can accommodate. Now, please don't do that during a busy event at the main airport, right in the middle of things. That is not going to go well for anybody. But if it's quiet on the frequency and you're looking to practice something, we can usually accommodate. That being said, you know, VATSIM is not the best place for lost communications because you have the text, just like you have your cell phone in the airplane. And quite frankly, there's very few places that we fly where you can't just descend a little bit and dial up the local facility on your phone and probably get in touch with somebody. At least that's what I would do in a real loss communications procedure these days. But that being said, if you have gotten approval for it and you want to do the whole thing, Squawk 7600, and then depending on your situation, whether you're proceeding VFR somewhere, whether you're following your IFR flight plan to connect an approach, whatever that may be, that can certainly be arranged. But as Alex said, I would certainly get approval for it first and try to pick the time you're going to do that. Yeah. Next question. Uh, yeah, I call it Cherokee Cessna triple or what your tail number? Yes. Uh, the the question was mo mostly referring to do we say, for example, Cessna 12345 or red Cessna turning base? FA recommends both. Um, instead of saying just your color and your aircraft type, say, um, say aircraft type and then your tail number. So, for example, I've recently been flying a Beechcraft Duchess. So, my tail number at an uncontrolled airport was Duchess 8 Golf Tango. So, both three letters of my tail number and the aircraft type to be looking out for. How to communicate with tower. Uh, that was, I believe, last week, or I'm sorry, the session number one, we talked about uh, VFR and IFR air traffic control communications. So we had a whole ground school on that. That was session one. I believe there may be a video of it somewhere. Uh, Evan can answer that one. Yeah, absolutely. On our forums, and I'll send the link to the thread. We're keeping track of all the sessions we've done so far with recordings of each of them. So I'll post a link to that in a moment. Okay, next question was, so air traffic control knows my plane just from the flight plan or do I need to tell aircraft type on first contact only? Uh, small difference here between the real world and the VATSIM. VATSIM air traffic control would not know your aircraft type if you did not file. A f Actually, there's really no difference between the two now that I think about it. Air traffic control would not know your flight plan, uh, your aircraft type, if you did not file a flight plan. Um, I'll say that filing VFR flight plans on VATSIM is uh, orders of magnitude more common than in the real world. Um, they, so you do need to tell them your aircraft type on first contact. Um, also not a bad idea to remind them of the aircraft type. So always say um, your aircraft type and then your last three of your tail number. Well, because there's, there is a bit of a difference we can highlight. And Alec, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that if you file a VFR flight plan in the U.S., ATC generally doesn't have that. So, you know, you've put in your flight plan, your aircraft type. That's not something they're going to see. That's used for flight service to give you appropriate emergency tracking. If you don't check in, cancel your flight plan, close it at some point, yeah. someone's going to come looking for you. But as far as ATC is concerned, they don't have any clue that you filed or haven't filed a VFR flight plan in the U.S. I think generally that's a fair yeah. statement, right, Alec? Yeah, that's correct. Um, in the U.S., that's one of the reasons that you are stressed so much. For starters, um, you can't. I've personally, ne for this reason, never had to file a flight plan, the only VFR flight plan rather. Um, if I was going long enough or over mountainous enough terrain that I would consider filing VFR flight plan, at that point, I just go IFR and go in the system and not worry about it. Uh, VFR flight plans are used for, usually, uh, generally speaking, for IFR. Not not IFR capable pilots or airplanes who have to go VFR over long distance who want that peace of mind where if something happens and they'll have search and rescue looking for them eventually. Uh, air traffic control has nothing to do with that. That's all flight service. Yeah. So any and VATSIM, that's not entirely the case. So in VATSIM, you can file a VFR flight plan, and generally speaking. 
most controllers, depending on which position they're working and which software they're using, we will generally have access to it. But that being said, there is no guarantee of that. And just because you file a flight plan doesn't mean we can always access it. So certainly the best practice is to give us as much information as you can. So depending on where you're calling from, and if you're calling, say, on the ground, give us your location. So you're at Nantucket Airport, where you are on the airport, your aircraft type, and your intentions. Uh, it's just, just calling up with, you know, Boston Senate number 12345 ready to taxi. That's a very difficult thing for us to answer. We have probably 60 different airports within our airspace, and then people can even call us from airspaces outside of ours. So if that's the only information that you give me on your initial contact, it's going to be pretty tough to figure out where you are and what you want. The more information you can give us, the better. And that's applicable for IFR too. So just because you filed a flight plan, it's still very helpful for us if you can tell us which airport you're at, where you are on the airport, and then what your request is. In that case, that you're looking for an IFR clearance to such and such an airport. So a question from Joey, uh, Joel Kraft, rather. Somewhat unrelated to the topic, but is regarding uh, smaller, untired airports, is there a resource to find better airport diagrams with taxiway names? Take Laconia or Bar Harbor, for example. Uh, you can always check the FAA chart supplement, or if it's not there, uh, actually third-party uh, third party services like ForeFlight, or you can check SkyVector might have them, but chances are if there's no official FAA plate for them, uh, your best bet is going to be a service like ForeFlight or something else that's third-party. What is the, just this is a personal curiosity question, Alec, what is the difference, did, did the AFD become the chart supplement or yes. are they two separate products? Okay. The, it, it, AFD is now just, just like the biannual flight review has become just a flight review, um, a chart, uh, a airport facility directory has become the chart supplement. Same deal, same exact thing. Um, Matt asks, would Navigraph work for his question? Uh, on Vatsim, sure. In the real world, I would not trust Navigraph. I I'm not even sure. I'm not sure if Navigraph would have like airport diagram charts for uh, yeah, smaller class I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. If, uh, if Jeppesen would put out or Navigraph would put out charts for that. Chances yeah. are, if it's a smaller airport like that, you don't really need a chart. It's probably going to be run one only one taxiway. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean a real real purpose of the. No, and I realize that they have JEP charts, but even JEP charts aren't necessarily going to give you a detailed airport diagram with specific taxiway labels at some of the smaller fields. I guess the point of those taxiway labels probably is for air traffic control to give you taxi instructions. I mean, maybe you might coordinate a little bit with other pilots on the ground, but generally speaking, you know, if you're taxiing, you can kind of see everyone else that's around you. So I'm not sure if that would be all as much value as you might get out of a, of a towered airport having specific labels. But yeah, definitely the chart supplement is where I would go. And a lot of the airports that are anything bigger than one runway, one taxiway do have at least some detail there. But you're right yeah. that SkyVector um, Sky doesn't always have that in as easy of a format. But you can, um, I don't know if it's valid if you can actually show this, but there is a way in SkyVector to be able to see that if you if you go to the airports page. You'll yeah, let me, get a little, uh, let, me, let me exit out of my screen. And you get a little pop-up that has a look at it from the, as it is now, chart supplements. You could use Keen, for example, if you want, or something like that. And you'll get an airport diagram, and many of them actually are labeled. Yeah, you can go to the airport page here, and you see Keen does happen to have an FAA um, official diagram plate available, uh, just because, I guess, it's big enough or complicated enough that FAA has deemed one necessary. But if you go to, like, a smaller airport, like... Uh, Let's see. Katama. Yeah, Laconia is a good example as well. He he mentioned that one, which doesn't have as much of that detail. Or the one you were going to go to would be just as well. Yeah, see, Laconia just has the chart supplement. Uh, this is was the AFD. Now it's called the chart supplement. You can see the only diagram is this little bit right here. Otherwise, there's no official FAA uh, chart supplement. Uh, Jep might have one, but that I don't know. If, I don't know if they do. I would I would be surprised if they yeah, did. Yeah, I, I, I doubt I doubt Jep would happen. An airline publication primarily when there's no airline there there's no reason to i mean possibly the airport might publish something on their website but there's again, no way I that think, would be official yeah well, of course not and you know again like what is the real need for a true airport diagram with taxiway labels you can kind of just look around and see what's going on I, a lot of these smaller airports too you know you get familiar either because you've gone there a bunch of times you're from there or you know if you're going there for the first time you've probably talked to the fbo or you've talked to whichever 
ground service you're going to be parking at, and they've given you some information. This is where we're located. This is what you do when you exit the runway. You kind of get that familiarity just from local procedure and knowledge more than you would get it from a chart the way that you will at the larger towered airports. Yeah, I agree with yeah, that. I find these supplementals extremely useful for uncontrolled small airports for the SOC location, because this is actually yeah. the main thing that you can find out, is it lit and where it is, and you know you don't know the airport, you're overflying, and you, where's my SOC, where's my SOC? Well, there you're looking and you know where they are, and they're actually very useful for that reason. I have a qu quick question about uh, specific maneuvers over obscure airports. I find, I don't know what it's called, but in in Alaska, there's tons of airports that have very specific maneuvers, VFR maneuvers, because they are loaded on top of another airport. Like there are three very, one on top of the other um, around Anchorage airports, very busy, and they have very specific VFR maneuvers and they are published, but they are difficult to find. And there are several, for example, Montgomery in, in San Diego area has very specific maneuvers, but they are not, I don't know where to find these. I, I found them, but is there a, a common uh, other location that you guys know where to find the specific behaviors for um, usually inside Bravo airports, uh, small airports? So let's take a look at uh, your, San what did you say, Santa Monica? Um, no, it's it's Montgomery next to San Diego. Uh, it's it's just tons of it, it what's very the, specific. Uh, what's one the identifier one. for that? M M Y M Y F, I think. Yeah, there it is. So let's zoom in on that. And let's take a look at the tag. Yeah, but you see, they they not published on on the charts. But I, I can tell you how you yeah. because there is a specific maneuver. And you have to fly uh, to enter depending where you're coming from because of the corridor. So, you know, for, for when you're coming from the, from the water side, you're supposed to fly south and enter left pattern for the left, uh, left runway. And then uh, from the other side is the right pattern and so and so. And they published on the airport. You can see that, you know, you're supposed yeah, to fly. You can, you can see what I'm looking at. You can, they're published by the city of San Diego in this case. Um, right. So yeah, but I found it. Nantucket, has, Nantucket actually has them as well. It's a very similar scenario. Published by the airport, you will not find them on any FAA publication. In fact, to find the Nantucket noise band procedures, you basically have to dig into the website to some presentation from four years ago where it's mentioned in passing. But right. again, but it's all found, local knowledge. For the, yeah. for, for the Alaska, I found them under, and I tell you, we are, I, I have a link to it now as an obscure giant amount of PDFs that they are published. This stuff is published and I can dig out and uh, afterwards tell them, tell you guys, but uh, uh, an extreme example is Alaskan airports because there is tons of them. Uh, the ones next to the um, Anchorage, uh, two of them, they have very, very uh, specific and you have to fly them. You have to know them and you have to fly them. There is no normal departures from there. So I was just I'd wondering be very if curious as to where them. they're published because uh, I, I, I struggle to see how uh, any aircraft, how any airport would have an official FAA uh, VFR departure. Yeah, I will. I will. I will um, um, follow up on the. Uh, I, I'll actually give you guys a link to it because uh, you know I mean. Uh, meaning I have the saved. I'll figure it out how to how to tell you guys because it's and there is another one very important uh, small airport next to Portland. In it, it, it's inside of Charlie, kind of under Charlie, but you're not supposed to fly normal maneuvers. There, there are specific published, including who you're supposed to talk to. <laughs> it's uncontrolled, but you're supposed to be on, on tower uh, with with Portland. So you know this kind of obscure stuff. Are you talking about Portland, Maine, or Portland, Oregon? Portland Oregon. in Oregon, under uh, there is one under the Charlie. Um, uh, uh, well, there are a couple here. Are you talking thing? about Vancouver the, or yeah, yeah, Evergreen the, one, or... the little one here on um, this one. Yeah, yeah, the, the, this thing. I think the one on the right other side also. The, the private. No, no, the, this one. Yeah, this one has a specific maneuvers. I'd be interested to see where you get those because I have never heard of any specific VFR maneuvers being published for uh, for VFR aircraft by the FAA. You. I'll find it, including charts. Yeah, <laughs> there are any charts. charts. The only thing I'll that you could see any. is um, is in the ch it might be in the charts supplement, like a note saying um, don't depart or arrive at this airport without talking to air traffic control. 
uh, for yeah, example. Yeah, no, that's different. That's what I'm telling you. This is uh, obviously you always read these, and there are specific recommendations how to behave around these small airports. But like I say, these obscure ones, really weird ones, like the, 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 the I'll give you the example of these Ala uh, Alaskan ones because they are clearly published how to and you're not going to do it any other way and they are actually like almost ifr charts <laughs> including you know uh, uh, you have to call them you don't just call tower i'm going to depart to this no you tell them it's a it's a city departure and you you're going to fly it and you have to know how and they are kind of well I'll, I'll, I'll show you the publication i'll figure out how so to publish. which publication is it actually in uh, my question being, which which FAA uh, group publications would it be in? Is it is it published under the so TERPS or was it published in the Charts? I can help out a little bit here. So the the one at Pearson specifically, this is a special flight rules area. So you can actually think about that like the CIFRA in Washington. You'll find this one in the actual uh, chart supplement it is now. So you can, I've actually got the link for it here if you want to look. It's on page twelve of the supplement in the Northwest. So there's some like that. And those are very unique to the areas where they've established a special flight rules area. So this is most likely what we're talking about here. And it's because of the fact that this airport is located so close to Portland. So that's probably what we're talking about here. There are a whole bunch of these that you'll see in different areas. So Northwest doesn't have a whole lot of them, but there are a bunch of them you'll find in the Northeast and other parts of the country. Alaska also has some very unique procedures, as was mentioned, because of the fact that it's such a unique area. There's so much terrain and there's so much interest in that specific area. So in Alaska, you'll see things you don't see anywhere else in the United States. For example, you'll see, and I could be wrong, but I believe it's the United States is only operating FAA established required this units. Is you literally this have is to call the one. Yeah, this is yeah. the one you just found it. Yeah. And in, in Alaska, there's a few airports. I forget which one it is. You literally are required to call the Unicom. They act almost like a controller, and you can't enter the class echo without being in radio communication. Where do you see that anywhere in the lower 50, right? So it's a, it's a really interesting airspace and area that we don't cover a whole lot of unless we actually physically are there, and it's all because of the terrain. Evan, go to a 383 page on this. This is what I was talking about. I only have one as an oh, oh I this is again. Alaska? No, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll find you. One second here. 383? Yeah, see if you can... Oh, no. So you, yeah, okay, you're on something else. You're on a different publication then. I thought you were on, on Alaska. Oh, are you talking about this one? Oh, no, I'm not on Alaska. No, this is, I, this I is scrolled down. Oh, okay. It's just an airport diagram. But again, a bunch I'm of sorry, airport diagrams in here. But anyway, that's the one if you go to Alaska. And I, why I ask that? Okay. Uh, is that commonly f easy to find that these, these, these giant ones that have everything on it? Well, this is part of the chart supplement that we're looking at right now. Okay. All right. The chart supplement. Yeah. I got you. Okay. Okay, but, but, so yeah, if you go to Alaska, you'll find them. Okay, so I, what, I tell you what my question was, uh, because I'm making a huge thing. Is there many, for example, in Boston area that have the special behaviors, or they are all pretty no. standard? There is no. No, I've never heard of a Boston area okay. airport that has something like this. But I'll but I'll point out that there's nothing that Boston area has from the FAA. But what you will find is local airport procedures that aren't regulatory, but that are highly recommended. And as I said before, Nantucket is a great example of this. So Nantucket has these voluntary noise abatement procedures that they really want people to follow. And they're published by the town of Nantucket. To be able to find them, you basically have to run through a presentation. Here, here it is if you're interested in clicking on a link. You have to literally find your way through this presentation and scroll all the way down to, uh, it's a sort of, highlighted in a couple of back slides of it. There's a few other places on the airport website. But again, unless you've been to the airport website, you've looked at the PDF, of course you're not actually going to have noticed those things. And they're not requirements. You're not going to get in trouble if you don't follow them, particularly on the network. But if you really want to get down into the weeds, you know, feel free. And this is the kind of thing that I was saying earlier. When you call up the FBO or when you call up the flight school that you're going to park at, they're going to say, hey, by the way, check out these airline corridors. I'll send you a link to them. Like, we really appreciate if you can stay over the water, right? That's, that's what you're going to see in Boston. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry for take up too much time. No, I think we've, we've mostly answered the question, so that's good. Anything else people wanted to ask while you're sitting here listening to these exciting discussions deep into the weeds on different VFR procedures? 
Okay, well, I think we'll wrap up this week. Next week, we do a little bit of a change. It's actually going to move to Mondays, and it's not next week. We're taking a week off. We're going to Monday, August the 10th for our next session. So for those of you who wanted to mark your calendars right now, the next time we're doing this is Monday, August the 10th, and that session is going to talk about IFR procedures. So it's not just, as I said, about clearances and about how to read and read back an IFR clearance. It goes into the detail of reroutes, of standard instrument departures, of flight planning, and a whole bunch of other topics that are relating to that. So please mark your calendars to join us again Monday, August 10th. And starting that Monday, we'll be continuing on Mondays every week as opposed to Wednesdays. We hope those of you who are here can join us then. Thanks to everyone for being part of the discussion today. Thanks to Mike and others for some great questions. And we'll look forward to seeing you again on Monday, August 10th. Same time. Same time.